Yeah, wrong. Right, so welcome back to the Art of Interesting People podcast for episode 16. Now, today I have Eric Everhard on the podcast. And Eric Everhard is one of the top paid and most recognised performers in adult films of the last two decades. He has won numerous male performer awards and has been enshrined in the Hall of Fame of the AVN and XRCO organisations. And in 2010, he embarked on a transformational journey studying NLP at one of the top institutions in America. And since then, he has dedicated his time and effort to helping men by teaching them elite level sexual skills to have confidence with women in the bedroom. Now, Eric has written a book titled, um, let me just pull it up, Unleash Your Sexual Superpowers, A Porn Star's Guide to Sexual Mastery. And I've spent the last few days listening to it. And I can honestly say I really enjoyed it and I've really written a couple of things down. But anyway, I'm joined by Eric now. So Eric, mate, how are you doing? How are you doing today? What's the crack? Fabulous, man. Glad to be here. So I'm, I'm excited for this conversation today. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you on. I'm buzzing to talk about your life. I'm buzzing to talk about your book and everything that comes with it. So I kind of like really want to kick off this podcast with kind of talking about your origin story. And I know from reading the book that it really started when you were a massage therapist in ninety in the late nineties. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I was uh, I was a massage therapist. <clears throat> well, I was going to school. This was in uh, nineteen ninety seven, and uh, so I was going to school. And on lunch break, you know, we'd all reconvene in this little cafeteria. I'd bring my lunch, eat my lunch, and uh, and read read one of the local papers. And there was this uh, there was this newspaper. It was called the Georgia Strait, and you know it had the what's going on in the city, the band listings, you know, kind of like a entertainment guide, so to speak. So I'm flipping through this thing, flipping through this thing, and then I turn the page, and it's like, bam! There's this like four inch by four inch ad looking for you know uh, women and couples to do a porno movie, and I'm just like, what the fuck is this, right? You know, because it's not, it's, I mean, this is Canada, right? Like, this isn't the yeah. kind of thing, especially late 90s, you would ever see, ever. Mm. So, and then it got me thinking because uh, there was this ex-girlfriend I had, and we used to sometimes watch porno movies together. And she would always kind of joke, you know, she'd be like, oh, yeah, you, you could do porn. I'm like, yeah, 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 thanks, sweetheart, right? Because you figure, <laughs> I mean, any any girl that you're with is obviously going to say, you're amazing, even if you suck, Right. Like they're not going to just yeah. totally trash your male ego and be like, you have a small dick and you're the worst lay ever. <laughs> like They're just not going to do it. So, so, you know, you take it with a grain of salt. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Thanks, sweetheart. Um, but then I saw this ad and it started getting me thinking. I was like, oh man, you know, like, well, she said you'd be good at that. Like maybe. Right. And, you know, obviously I, I, I loved women ever since I was a kid. I was like obsessed with, with women. So I was like, okay, this, this could be something. And so I called them up. Right. And then uh, on cue, like every porno company I've pretty much ever known my whole career, they hung up on me. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, and I was like, oh, man. And, and I didn't really think too much about it. You know, I just I went back to school and this was about I would say probably about seven months later. You know, same scenario. Right. Yeah. Having lunch. Got the paper going through the paper. Hey, what's going on in the city? Bam. There's that ad again. I'm like, no, ah, you know, it's toying with me. And, um, and, and I actually thought to myself, I said, well, you know, you didn't really put in that much effort, right? I called once I got rejected. That was it. So what I started doing was I said, okay, like I'm actually going to put in some effort. So I called and I called and I called, right? I was just relentless yeah. calling, 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 and, you know, of course they're just hanging up time and time again, but, um, eventually I got someone different on the phone and this actually turned out to be the owner of the company because I recognized his voice. And, uh, you know, I, I talked to him and he said, well, tell you what, why don't you come down to our studio and we'll take some Polaroids of you, you know, for everybody listening, this is back in yeah. the day when there were Polaroids, <laughs> we didn't, we didn't have digital cameras yet. And, uh, and he said, you know, when maybe one day, if we think you got the equipment, maybe we could get you a job one day. I'm like, fantastic like he didn't hang up on me so i'm like we're we're making progress right so so i went down to uh to their studio and it was in um uh east east vancouver east hastings street like just off of there so seedy area of town right like there was like 
a hooker stroll like two blocks away and you know some drug dealers and stuff and it wasn't the nicest the area. yeah 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 it was a seedy area of town and uh so i go there walk up the stairs knock on their door and uh, the guy opens it and he just looks at me and he goes, goes are you mitch because that's my real name and uh and i'm like yeah and then he just deadpan stares me in the face and he goes can you fuck a girl for us right now and i was like you can imagine my face right like i'm, I'm 21 years old at the time yeah. too right and i'm just like oh yes i will you know, just wide-eyed and i think i let out this little this little squeak of a yep and that was it and they brought me in and uh, it just it just so happened that um they had a actress who had worked with them she was a she was a part-time stripper but she had showed up she was hanging out at their studio and so she was already there i showed up and they said well you know what fuck it let's see if he can do it and that's exactly what you did yeah and that's that that was how the journey began and you know the funny thing about the journey was honestly i just wanted to collect a story you know mm -hmm. i i really in it like in my in my heart of hearts i thought you know when i'm 85 years old and I'm wearing Depends diapers, right? And I'm in the old folks home and I'm sitting around the, the table and I'm playing poker with the guys. I want to have the best story in the old folks home. And so I thought like, this will be one hell of a story, right? But that was it. Like there was no, there's no part of me that thought this was going to be anything but a one-off. And there was nothing that, nothing where I thought it would be anything but just collecting a story. So. Perfect. And um, and you also mentioned that you you were the only male performer within like that year that got called back. Well, here was the thing, I was the only guy that was able to do it. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have to remember the time period. You know, there was no Viagra, there was no Cial, there was none of this. You know, mm. crap that kids are taking today, right? Like it's just like it was old school. You could do it. You could get yourself in the right mental mindset to do it, you could block out all the distractions because you, you like, let's be realistic, right? You know, if you're, if you're in your early twenties, I mean, for fuck's sakes, the wind should blow and you should have a heart on. Yeah. Like that's yeah. functionally how it works. Right. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm always disillusioned by even today. Now I, I know young guys, they're, they're going out to the bar, right? They're like, I'm going to go get a girl, but, but they're like, I got, you know, my Viagra just in case. What the fuck do you need Viagra? I've never taken Viagra. I'm 44 years old for Christ's sakes, right? <laughs> so if I don't need it, how do you at 22 require anything other than uh, you should, here's the two requirements you should require, right? A nice ass and a nice pair of tits. That should be your Viagra. Like that should be it, right? Like, yeah. What else do you need? So I, I think, I think definitely there's, there's, there's something going on, um, you know, with, with guys today, especially the young guys that, that they're struggling even more to get their mindset correct. And I'm not sure what that is. I'm not sure what is the, what is the pressures of society? I don't know what it is. If it's the demasculinization of society, I'm not sure what it is because I'm seeing now more and more guys are struggling in this area than I think ever before. Do you think social media or maybe the internet might have uh, something to do with that? Well, I mean, we've got all these things, right? So, so is, is that possible? Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe guys are feeling uh, even more so that they don't measure up because now you have Instagram, you know, but I mean, you know, when I was a kid, there was, you know, it was like you, you had no idea if you measured up or not, because obviously like we're not comparing dick sizes, right? So, I mean, yeah. the, the funny thing is I had no idea. This is a true story. I actually had no idea I was super well endowed until I got into porno. <laughs> right? I thought I was yeah. just, you know, Mr. Average um, because, I mean, come on. It's like, you know, in Canada, especially, it's like you are not, you know, like if you're a hetero dude, like, hey, man, you are you're in a locker room or you're peeing in a stall. You are looking straight forward, man. You're not looking side to side. You're not comparing straight nothing. Forward. Like, man, in the bathroom. Straight forward. <laughs> Stiff so, looking at my dick. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so the first time I got thrown into the mix, uh, you know, was when I really, really started working full time in porno in um, in Los Angeles. And then, of course, you know, you start working with these girls because, you know, everything's relative, right? Like we everything, everything has to be based on your own experience and based on relativity. So 
I don't think any guy could functionally really say if he's got a big dick. Well, it's relative, right? Like, well, I'm okay, big... maybe, maybe if you throw me into some, you know, Asian population somewhere, they're going to be like, oh my God, he's a giant. But I mean, <laughs> stereotypes being what they are, I mean, I'm sure there's some definitely some places in Africa you throw me and they're going to be like, what the fuck is this little thumbnail that you brought <laughs> to the party, right? So it is all relative. Um, so you, you got to take it all with a grain of salt. But, um, but you know, as, as guys, like for me specifically, I had no idea until I was in porno. And then all these girls were like, Jesus Christ, what is this? I said, okay, I, I guess I'm doing better than average. I guess I've got a fucking good dick here right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's quality. Um, so, yeah, so you start doing pornos and then you credit your mate Jeff. Um, with being one of the people in your life that you um if you didn't have Jeff then you wouldn't be here today. Oh not not at all. He was he was instrumental in in many things. Specifically I would say mindset. Mm. Because um when I grew up, you know, it was very I don't know how it is in the UK, but um Canada, you know, it's very sort of there's the white picket fence path, I would say, right? Okay. Go to university, right? mm. get a good job, get married, 2.1 kids, maybe a pet, right? Single yeah. car house, right? Like, like it's very much there is this path. And um, in growing up, you know, I, I, I had never met anybody that owned a business. I didn't know any entrepreneurs, right? Like that wasn't anybody that was in my family circle because my, my parents, you know, they had... My mom had a government job and, and my, my, my dad worked as an accountant. So they, they had, you know, white collar jobs, but they, they didn't own a business. They went to work, clocked out at five and that was it. So to meet um, a real, like honest to God entrepreneur, even though Jeff was a special kind of entrepreneur, of course, but um, that, that really had an impact because, you know, his mindset really was that anything was possible. And I had just never... I'd never come across that level of positivity before, right? You know, and if yeah. you think about it, even just from a mindset perspective, I mean, I, I tell people this all the time now because I see how it's impacted my life. But you really are the product of the five people you spend the most time with. Yeah, 100%. You know? I totally agree with that. You know, and if you, if you hang around fucking negative Nancys that are just like, oh, woe is me, nothing's possible, blah, blah, blah. You really do start to think, nothing is possible you know and and every every uh wealthy rich go-getter that i know like they're the most positive people in the world they're like oh man we're gonna make this happen I'm like how we don't know but we're gonna make it happen like they're just they're on it right and you need that uh, that irrational self-confidence because if you don't have irrational self-confidence you're not going to move forward anyways you know right. Yeah, I think I think sometimes um, being young is very, very useful and helpful as well. You know, it was one of the things I remember when when I was in, doing my NLP studies that, where we studied um, the brain and in men, I believe it's the frontal lobe. It's not the, the, the area of your brain that can understand consequences is not really fully finished. Um, uh growing like it's not it's not done till you're about 27 years old Got another five and there's and there's a big correlation there well just look at prison populations right what are what are prison populations 30 and under primarily so what do you what, what are the two things you have going on there well massive amounts of testosterone and inability to actually comprehend consequences because if you really thought you know hey i'm gonna be doing 20 years like if you really thought you were gonna do 20 years you probably wouldn't do what you did right yeah. I mean, even me, I was... Especially in your industry, like, you kind of... I mean, it's an industry that's not like any other thing in the entire world. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> when I got in, I was 21 years old. I, I dropped out of school, 22, go with my buddy who's the drug dealer. We're going down to America. We're going to make it. I mean, that was insanity. But uh, there was no consequences in my brain. I was like, no, man, this is, of course this is what you would do. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I think I think sometimes being young and not necessarily understanding consequences, I mean, it can have negative impact, but it can also have extreme positive impact because it allows you to be 
irrationally self-confident because you think nothing's going to happen to you. I always, um, if I always want to take a chance, whether that be my life, and but I also have that the uh, the thought at the back of my mind, Connor. If this goes wrong, if this doesn't happen for you, the worst thing that's going to happen is you move back in with your parents. They're cooking clean for you. Well, not cook, not clean for me, but they'll cook for me, and then I'll they'll do my washing. I'll do my washing or something like that. That's the worst thing that could happen. And when you have that, you know, for me, I have that like mindset like. But that's the worst thing that's probably going to happen if something doesn't go my way, whether it's like, say, moving to another country or like taking an opportunity in the job or something like that. that that's mm-hmm. just what's in my back of my mind. So I don't know if like that's kind of related or anything like that. But I mean, in terms of like being young and stuff, that's what I, that's what I personally think if I want to take an opportunity. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you know, I mean, that that is a, a beautiful thing, too. It's it's. um you know, and this is kind of, I know this is going to be on, on off tangent, but you know, one of the, one of the things about, um, or at least that I've really noticed, especially when it comes to, 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 to being a man in masculinity is it's a, it's a whole different journey than a woman's ever going to have. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so, so when we look at, you know, cause people talk about equality and it's like, no, 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 the sexes are not equal. They're, 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 they're totally different. Right. Yeah. So it's not to say we're not equal as people, but but how things show up is totally unequal. You know, it's like if you're pretty and you have a nice pair of tits, I'm sorry, every door in the world gets open to you at 18 years old. Right. Like that's just fact, you know, and as a guy, <laughs> you're 18 years old. Good luck out there. Like, like no, nobody gives a shit about you. Right. So but also I, I've noticed like as, as a man, there is a there's a certain burden of performance that just. I, I don't know that any woman could quite understand because, you know, I remember my, my business partner, he said it, um, he said it well to me once. And, and it's funny cause he, he just had a kid and he had the, he had the wrong sex according to him. But he, he used to say, he goes, Oh God, he goes, if I, if I have a kid, he goes, I'd love to have a, 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 a daughter. And I was like, why is that? He goes, cause I will never, he goes, he goes, as long as she's somewhat attractive, he goes, I will never have to worry about her. <laughs> because there there will be some guy that will probably <laughs> help take care of her. And he goes, if I have a son, I know he's on his own. Like nobody's taking care of him. Right. Like, and, and, you know, as I've gotten older, that realization really does start to kick in. Right. You know, like when your parents start to die off, you're just like, wow, it is totally up to me, you know? Mm. And, and, and it's, it it's, it's, there's a sadness to it, but then there's an also, this amazing piece where where when you fundamentally understand it's all up to you it's really empowering because you're like well i mean this is all up to me like i can do whatever i can change my life it's not and you lose that sort of um victim mentality right where it's like oh woe is me it's like no man there's there's no time for woe is me like there's time for make shit happen Hmm. so the world's on my shoulders now i need to supply yeah yeah but 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 there's there is there's something there's something powerful and something very, uh, I don't know if we want to call it honorable, but there, there's something, at least I feel like, like, whereas a man, you want that, like you want to slay that dragon, metaphorically speaking. So. Perfect. Um, now you've really hit the nail on the head there, actually. Um, so the book, um, we'll move on to the book because I'm quite excited to talk about the book. Um, Let's talk about it. What did yes. you think of it? I really enjoyed it. I, so I didn't know what to expect when going in because um, I was, um, am I going to release my sexual superpowers here? What's the crack? What? Um, what's going to happen? And then the more I got into it, the more I started to really, like, I really got into it and I really enjoyed it. I uh, wrote, wrote a couple of notes down um, and I thought the way I listened to the audio book and it's not really like any book that I've read or listened to before in my life. Um, it really kind of had me hooked um, in terms of the language you use. You know, it really, you can tell, <laughs> you can tell that, you know, it was written by a porn star, but in a, in a really good way. Um, and some of the chapters, uh, yeah, I thought they were cracking. So if any, for the listeners, the book's kind of, it's built into certain chapters on how to have uh, the best sexual advice and it's kind of built into interludes as well which are stories based around your life in the porn industry um but i kind of want to know for the first question i want to ask you about the book is 
I want to know the one of the pieces of advice that in the book that a lot of people have asked you about and said, oh, Eric, that has been uh, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever had. And I've gone home to my girl and she's been so happy with my performance in the bedroom. Oh, I, I would I would say probably chapter three. Chapter three. Uh, yeah, for, yeah, the, yeah. for the listeners, chapter yeah, three the, is the, how the, to go down on your girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Puss eating. Um, <laughs> b- because, you know, like when I when I revealed you know, the, the cues that you need to be paying attention to. Like every time I've said that to guys, they're like, wait, what? It, it, it does that? I'm like, yeah. And then they go back and start paying attention. They're like, holy shit. And, you know, these are guys too that, you know, they, they've been having sex a long time. So it, it's almost like, um, like, like shining a light on something. And, and once they see it, they're like, how the, sh- how the fuck didn't I see that all these years? Right. Um, mm. You know, and for me, you know, it, the, the the process of sexuality was really interesting because, um, you know, I, I, I meet and I, I, I see, you know, different, uh, you know, their sex coaches, sex therapists, blah, blah, blah. Right. And I'm like, well, well, OK, um, where are you? Wh- why aren't you guys giving this advice? Right. Like and, and we can go down the rabbit hole. of OK, what makes a real coach? Is it that Ph.D.? Because I don't have a Ph.D. I ain't got nothing. I just have way more than 10,000 hours of experience. Like every, and you know, and, and so the reason I wrote the book the way I did was I understood, look, I've learned these things all through experience. You know, I've learned how to get hard in any situation without any sort of drugs. I've learned how to last as long as necessary because to me, it's not about lasting a crazy amount of time. It's about conscious choice, right? Right. Because, um, because I've also worked with clients that can't finish fast enough. Like I have actually met clients that have the opposite problem because they have they have spent so long, you know, rewiring their neurology the opposite way that I've I've worked the, and they've come to me. They're saying I can't I can't have an orgasm in under an hour. My girlfriend hates me because trust me. It, like every every guy has this thinking they say oh i want to last five hours no man the the a girl's pussy will always get tired way before your dick will because the 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 skin is much thinner so the, it can get torn it can get ripped you know as soon as she's even getting a little bit dry like it's it, you, you can your dick can take a way way more intense beating than a woman's pussy can so they will always have a limit Right to where they say, "Oh, it's awesome! You can last this long." And then it's the tipping point where it's like, "Oh fuck! Now I'm getting sore." And it's like, "Hey, buddy, can you fucking come?" Like, like, and then they just yeah. get angry. They're like, "This is over. I'm sore now." Like, you know. So it's not about lasting this crazy amount of time. It is about lasting long enough that you can have an enjoyable experience, and it's a conscious act. So right. if you want to have a quickie with your wife, and it's really that, you're like, "Hey." Let's bang one out in five minutes. It's like, okay, then you want to be able to come in five fucking minutes. You know, if she says, hey, you know what? I'm really horny. I want, I want, you know, 40 minutes from you. Then you need to be able to make that conscious decision and say, you know what? Okay. At the 40 minute marker, I'm not, that's when I'll come and not before. So to me, it, it, it really, because mastery to me is, is when you have, um, you know, when you, when you can master your mind and you master your body and in there that's where you have that confidence that's true you know sexual confidence mm. you know you you need to master those two pieces and when they come together and you can you know you can get hard whenever you want like there's no stress about it and you can consciously decide when the act is going to end because when you come the act is over really you know yeah. um and 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 that is that is also something the guys need to think about and i think a lot of the times they don't want that burden, but it is the burden of man. You know, I, I, I talk about it in the first or second chapter where I say, look, you know, women, they're the, the, the decision makers. They are the gatekeepers of sexuality from that perspective. I mean, if, let's face it. If a girl is super hot, you know, and she walks into a bar, I mean, dude, we're all going to fuck her. Okay. And, and if, if, if the listener right now is saying, no, I wouldn't do that. Bullshit. 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 Right. If she's if she's hot enough, no, you are your hand is being raised with the rest of us, right? Like we're all running at her, being like, pick me, pick me, right? <laughs> Give me your number. And that's and and that's the thing. Like she is going to pick. 
And she's going to be like, no, 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 no. Oh, you. Yes, you. Mm. But that's where her decision making ends. Right? You think because. In... Go on, what you're going to say? No, I was just going to say, like, once you get into the sexual act, you know, it doesn't matter how much she wants to have sex with you. If you can't get it up, sex ain't happening. Mm. You know, if, if, if you last all of 30 seconds, it's over. So, so the actual act, like that's where the man is controlling it. So the decision she is controlling, cause she's going to be, you know, deciding, Hey, does she like you? Is it your personality? Whatever it is like, but she's going to be saying, okay, you, you, you get a crack at it. But then when it comes to the actual act, there's very little that she is actually going to be in control of because like I said, she could want it as bad. She could be like a, a sexual tigress. And if you can't get it up, sex is not happening. I mean, you could do other things, but still, if, if her idea was being penetrated, no, it's not going to happen. In the book, there's a recurring theme from the start to finish, and that's all about mindset within the bedroom and mindset within... You talked about uh, you just talked about it earlier there when within your mind and body, and in the book you say if you can't if you can't go and jerk off right now then no then your dick's not working but if you can do that then the dick's working you got no problem with your dick and a yeah. lot of the problems is obviously in your mind, um you know I kind of want to know how do you kind of approach men when men come to you and say look uh, Mitch I want to be coached um I'm I'm pretty shy with my mindset. How do you coach men on terms of mindset? Well, so one of the first things that I like to do is, is, is exactly the piece that you talked about is I'll say, okay, like let's get some backstory, right? Like, let's see, first I want to walk them through and say, okay, at what point in the interaction is where the fear starts to come up, right? Because for everybody, it's going to be different. So it's like, well, we gotta, we gotta see, okay, where, where in the interaction do you start to feel the anxiety? Like, where does it start to go wrong? Is it, is it when you're kissing the girl? Is it, uh, is it the moment that you have to take your clothes off? Right? Is it the moment that now maybe she has to go down on you? Or is it the moment that you have to penetrate? Like I've known guys, they can be hard. And then the minute they have to penetrate goes down. Right? So, so let's, let's, let's first off, let's think, well, where is it going wrong in the interaction? And then also, I always tell my clients, I say, well, let's find out what your default state is. And that's kind of what I was referring to, where you, it's your ability to jerk off and, and functionally get a heart on, on your own. Because that's the true you, right? Mm. So we want to know, like, well, what, what are the qualities to that? Because everybody's still going to have different qualities, right? Like, so if I said, you know, hey, uh, get your favorite playboy or whatever, like, and, and jerk off. Like, so if you had like 10 guys doing that, they're all going to have, they're going to get two full hardness at different times. So for me, you know, like I take a little bit longer to get fully, fully hard, but when I'm fully, fully hard, the blood doesn't like to go back out. So that's how my body functions. I know other guys like, man, they can get like 20 seconds. They're pointing at the sky. Conversely, you know, the second they stop, you know, touching their dick or something like 20 seconds later, it's flaccid, right? right. So you're going to look at, okay, well, how strong is my erection? How long does it take to get? Once it gets there, how long does it take to leave? Um, what is the, you know, some guys, when they have an erection, it's like, it's like glass, it's like steel. Other guys, even when they have an erection, you could still, there's still some flex, you know, the, the tissue has like a sponginess to it. And, and there's no, there's no better than another. It's just like, these are all the differences. And I've seen them, you know, sadly, cause I've been around way too many, way too many naked guys the last 23 years. So I've seen how all these, how the, all of these things stack up. So once you know that now you have like a baseline, right? Because now you know, what is the true you? That's what I call it. Cause this is the true mm -hmm. you. So anything else that's not that, that's not you. You know, you're going into yeah. a sexual interaction. If anything else is happening, well, you can't sit there and say, oh, no, I'm broken. Something's wrong with me. Because it's like, no, you have to realize this is not you. Because the, the, the true you was the guy that was sitting there with the playboy that had no problem. That's the actual you. So then, you know, if, if this is now presenting itself where you're having some sort of issue, now let's figure out where, where 
in the interaction is that mental block happening right, right. is it is it a fear of of what she's going to think of you right because maybe that's coming out you know the time you know the second that you are needing to get hard is it a, a shame about being naked that could be happening the second now you have to take your clothes off um is it a uh, you know, am I big enough thing? Is it is it a mental fear over the size? Again, that's going to be something you're going to be fine up until you actually have to show the size of your dick. Um, is it a fear of um, premature ejaculation? Because if you're if you're if you're so in your mind thinking, God, I hope I don't come quick, and you've got that fear, well, now you're going to have a performance anxiety issue as well. Because again, like you have to, it's something that I often talk about. It's like in sex you really need to create what I call white noise between your ears. Like there, there was, um, and I, and I, I talked about the incident in, in my book. Um, uh, I, uh, I was doing a scene. This was probably early two thousands. And there was this real famous art photographer and he was running around on set and he ended up, um, for the life of me, I'd had, have to remember his name. It's Saul, Saul something. Um, but he created a book. It was called the Valley. So if anybody wants, they could go on Amazon, look up the, you know, the photography book, The Valley. Um, and um, yeah, it's a beautiful book. But he was going around on different porno sets and he was taking these shots for this um, for this photography book. And he actually took some shots of me that didn't end up in his book, but they ended up in a magazine. So I actually have the magazine back in Canada. But uh, after, so he watched me do my scene. And then after the scene, he came to talk to me and he's like, oh, my God, that was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Because, you know, I, I was it was such an acrobatic, such an athletic scene and he had just never seen anything like that. So he asked me, well, what were you thinking about in there? And I just remember looking at him and I it was like deadpan. I was like, nothing like what what am I supposed to be thinking about? And that that I I noticed I was like such a curious thing to ask somebody like what were they thinking because i realized like the whole time i'm doing and when i'm doing i'm not thinking and it's really this this state of just you know white noise like if you ever remember those old you know poltergeist movies where the little girl puts her hands on yeah. the tv and it's like Shh, and i'm like that's what's going on between my ears mm. there are no thoughts like what should i be thinking about i'm here with a beautiful woman there shouldn't like Wait, am I thinking about, geez, you know, do I need to get a haircut next week? Well, I don't know. That's not a sexy thought. You know, am I thinking about what I'm going to be having for dinner? Am I thinking about, you know, ooh, geez, I hope I get hard. Well, that's not going to be a productive thought. Like none of those thoughts are serving you. You know, it's, it's very much, you know, if you've ever read um, Eckhart Tolle, you know, his book, The Power of Now. I mean, it's really the same principle. Like the only thing that functionally matters is the present moment. And what are you doing with the woman in the present moment? How are you creating the interaction? How are you experiencing? How are you sensing? Like, how are you tasting? How are you smelling? Like all that stuff, but man, thoughts, mm. thoughts are not it, going to serve you at all. This kind of, you know, this white noise that you're talking about, you, you've talked about in the book and you've given some uh, examples of say, when you're in the Dominican Republic, that was a good example of when you just needed to focus. And you say, and there's a quote in the book where you just said, if someone talked to me right now, I wouldn't have heard them. And is that the kind of mindset you you want to be in? Oh yeah, like like here's the thing, and and often I'll I'll use certain analogies that some people can can um, sort of latch onto that that illustrate my point. Um, so you know, for example, like I'm sure there's lots of people that do meditation, right? And it's yeah. like you can give like intense focus to your breath, for example, right? And you're at that moment when you're really focused on the breath, you're not paying attention to anything else, right? And then if you lose that focus, okay, then you might notice something, but you come back to your focus, right? And you're back on the breath or it's a mantra or a big one is, is when there's something that could be pseudo life threatening, right? And so I use uh, a gym analogy because if you know, you have two or 300 pounds on a bench press over top of your head. Like when that thing's coming down, I swear to God, nobody out there is thinking, geez, what should I, what am I going to have for dinner? Right? Like, it's like any thoughts that are not just functionally move the bar are very counterproductive. Right. And so, you know, that's why a lot of people that are gym junkies say it, it feels very meditative. Well, it's meditative because you're not having thoughts in the moment. 
think your only focus is on move the weight, move the bar. Because if I don't, it's going to crush me. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so all these very similar principles are what you're bringing into the bedroom. And so a lot of the things that I'll, that I'll tell my clients is like, you, 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 first you have to figure out what is it that you would love to do to a woman, right? And then you got to do it. You got to execute, right? If you love eating pussy, I mean, go in there. Don't just play around. But I mean, put all your, all your attention, all your knowing, everything into what you're doing. Like completely focus on that, mm. you know, because if you're, you, you can't, it's, it's like the idea of um, you know, uh, multitasking, right? Yeah. People always say, oh, multitasker. And, you know, People most, say most everybody will tell you multitasking doesn't exist. Okay. All it is is they have the ability to jump attention very fast between one thing and another. Because you can't fundamentally focus on two things at the same exact time, right? So you're focusing right. on one thing, back to another, back to another. So it's, it's the same thing. It's like, well, just give all your focus. Okay. Like now we're not trying to multitask. We're singular tasking. Just, yeah. just give 100% of your attention to what you're doing because you can't be sitting there thinking and having a boohoo moment in your brain. If you're just, if you are just doing. Right. And conversely, it's, it's, it's the opposite, right? Like if you, if you really start to go down that um, negative rabbit hole, what does it do? It just, it just, um, starts a, uh, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, there's one thing I talk about. I've, I've said to a lot of guys, I said, the worst thing you could ever do are these words. I hope I get hard. Totally. Just putting that out to the universe, right? You're going into an interaction saying, oh, geez, I hope I get hard. Okay. Well, now you've set it up where if you don't get hard right away, now you have just, you, you've, you've just confirmed your thought, Right. So now let's, let's see how this just starts to snowball, right? It's like, well, I hope I get hard. Oh God, I didn't get hard right away. Well, uh, I hope she doesn't notice. Oh my God, she's noticing. Oh geez. I hope I'm, <laughs> oh man. Like it just, the spiral starts and then you're like, oh, this happened last time. Oh, oh, I'm broken. I mean, it, it, it becomes this big thing so quick. And it all started with, geez, I hope I get hard today. Right? How about instead of any hope, how about instead of any thought, we just go in and we do and we experience and we act. Right. And we focus, yeah. you know, and and you you there's there's a lot of um, you have to realize it's one of the things where I talk about in the book where I say, um, you know, I discovered you really have two separate hard ons. Right. It's two different hard ons. And what most people do is they collapse them into one. So they think they have one type of hard on. I'm like, that's bullshit. You basically have two. You have the hard on of the mind. Right. Where you are. You're seeing something. Right? You're seeing something about a woman. Uh, you might be making out with her, but there's something that is evoking uh, an erection to occur from, from something of a mental state. Right, So it's this quote-unquote arousal. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing about that. I mean, it's an awesome hard-on, but it's not reliable. It's not repeatable. We're basically, it's like we're handing our our body, our agency up to the, to the winds of God. It's like we're putting our thumb up, you know, Mm, how's the wind feeling today? Oh, okay, I guess I'm going to get an erection today. <laughs> well, that's not helpful, right? Because I, I tell you what, you could be making out with your girlfriend, right? So no, we're, now we're not even talking in some crazy public sphere or anything difficult. You're just making out with your girlfriend. You make out with her on Monday. And for whatever reason, you get hard in your pants making out with her. Awesome. And then you make out with her Wednesday. Same time. Everything's the same. And nothing budges in your pants. Well, why? Guess what? We don't fucking know why. I mean, what was it that suddenly turned you on on Monday that didn't turn you on necessarily on Wednesday? And is it to say that you're not turned on? Because in your mind, you're definitely turned on, but somehow that turn on isn't being articulated to your penis, right? Does it mean you're broken? Do we suddenly say, oh man, I didn't get a heart on making out with my girl, so is there something wrong with me? No. Like, who the fuck knows? Like, it's, it, it's, it's this mystical thing. You know, so the hard on of the mind is such a mystical thing because it's totally not controllable. We never know when it's going to occur. It just happens or it doesn't. Now, when we have the second type of hard on, which is the physically created hard on, that we now have control over because that's totally separate of the mind. That is just based on sensation. It's like, I feel the correct sensations in my penis. My penis responds and gets hard. 
that is repeatable. It is reliable. You can do it every time. It's just about focus. And if I, if I had to rely on the mental hard on, I would have lasted in, in the porno business for one week, not 23 years. Trust me. <laughs> so, so you have to understand that, that fundamentally as a guy, you are in control of your body, even though you may want to think you are not. Usually when it's like you don't have control, it's because you are relying on this whimsical mental hard on that may or may not occur. Some absolute bombs being dropped there. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> some of the advice in the book I've never heard before in my entire life. And I know within the book that you talk about these sex TV experts and stuff and what the fuck do they know? Um, I kind of want to know, right? Why do you think that these people think they like, say like they, they give sex advice, but when you look at this sex advice, you think that doesn't fucking work. Why the fuck are you saying that advice? Why do you think that? Why, why do you think they, I mean, you say that they've probably read that in a book, but you've maybe, you've, you've uh, worked, say worked with loads of women. You've done porn for 23 years. Um, why do you, why do you think your advice, why do you think your proven advice is better than theirs? Well, because I've experienced it in reality. Yeah, absolutely. Like like, like, like <clears throat> everything I've talked about, I've, I've seen and experienced, right? So it's, it's, it's firsthand, it's firsthand knowledge. It's firsthand from my experience. Um, and you know, here's the thing that you have to understand. When I look at most advice, I look at it coming from two ways, right? Mm. So number one, they read it in a book. Okay, great. Well, where did that guy get it from? And where did he get it from? Okay. And then, of course, you'll have people that say, well, it's science. Trust the science. Well, okay. I don't know about you, but what kind of experiments did they do? Because if I've seen 99% of guys fail trying to do porno, I mean, what? Did you magically get all these guys and magically convince them to get hard-ons and you watched how they performed? Or did you just ask them? So now, really so now we're, we're, we're getting into, well, well, you know, we took a survey and we asked, guess what, motherfuckers? When I was in high school, everybody in the class said they had a nine-inch dick. <laughs> I got a seven-incher, okay? My dick is seven inches long and it's longer than, it's, and seven inches around. And those are real factual measurements, not from my asshole, but actual measurements, right? <laughs> right. Because right. I'm, like, I'm like, I'm sorry, I've never seen a, this mystical nine-inch dick that you're talking about. I don't see those in porno. But magically, everybody in my high school had one. So if you are going to ask people on a survey their sexual, it, like what they think about sex, or I'm sorry, you are not getting any sort of answers that are going to help anybody. Mm -hmm. Because no man is going to sit there and really be honest about his sexuality on, on some forum or some uh, scientist saying, hey, how big is your dick? Oh, mine's 10 inches. No, how long do you last in the bedroom? Oh, two hours. I mean, it's just comical, right? So, so again, I, I will say, you know, to these researchers, well, d did you magically get, you know, a thousand men to fuck in front of you? And did you like, you know, observe? Yeah. Like, where are you getting this? So, again, I don't see that. I don't see anybody doing that. I've done it. So I have my, my personal research. I have my observations and I see the things that have worked with women, I see the things that don't work with women, I see the things that have worked for men, and I see the things that don't work for men. And I've seen it, you know, live and in person. So mm -hmm. that's, like I said, that's where I get my perspectives from. It's crazy. You really are um, a person who has experienced it all. Um, and you've probably seen so many things. Um, but yeah, you've seen so many men probably drop out of the porn industry, probably seen women drop out of the porn industry, you've seen women stay in the porn industry, you've seen everything. So this kind of experience and knowledge is built up over 23 years. And now you're kind of executing it in ways that can help men and, you know, get better in the bedroom. Um, so I kind of want to talk about your lock and key theory and where sure. and how did this come around? Because I know you studied uh, neuro-linguistics programming um, and yeah. you got a master's in that, haven't you? Um, 
did this kind of, you know, study a neurolinguistics program and this kind of lock and key theory build on from that? No, I, I mean, for me, for me, the NLP was more about, um, you know, learning how to effectively coach men and help reframe their, their ideals and the, the way they think about themselves and the way they think about the, the world and the universe. But with the lock and key thing, that was something that I personally experienced. And, you know, when I first came across it, I, I just knew what I was experiencing and I couldn't understand it. And right. I remember, remember to this day, and I, I think maybe I wrote, wrote about it in the book, but if I didn't, one day I was working for this company and uh, this was probably, it had to be, it was somewhere 99, 2000 in this ballpark. You know, my first, my first two years in the business in it in Los Angeles. And I was doing this threesome scene. And uh, so it's two girls. And it was some sort of um, like a bikini swimsuit sort of shoot. So they got their swimsuits on. We're out by a pool. And, and I'm thinking, okay, like I'm going to, you know, I'm talking to the director. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do some high energy stuff. You know, we'll start with them like both in doggy. And I'll just go, you know, between the girls really fast. And, you know, keep this, you know, because, you, you know, if you have a threesome scene, you want to have high energy. And you want to keep everybody engaged and everything. So, I, so this was my plan. And I remember, so I start the scene and I penetrate the first girl and literally I get like five strokes, right? I'm like, holy shit, right? Like, like I want to, I want to come. I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's stop that nonsense, right? And I, and I'm thinking, well, okay, if I pull out, you know, just give myself like, you know, 10 seconds, maybe that 10 seconds is enough for me to, you know, get my wits about me and continue on. So I, I pull out quick and go in to start having sex with the other girl and i'm like yes my strategy worked right like now yeah i totally have control i'm like oh, okay ah yeah my strategy was was what happened so i have sex with the other girl for i don't know two three four minutes whatever and then i go back to the first girl well god damn five strokes again is all i get i'm like what the fuck is going on like and that's that was the first time that i really i really had this understanding that i was like hey there is a qualifiable difference because, you know, people always like to, you know, when, when they look at vaginas, they're like, you can see how they look different on the outside, but we're none of us are ever thinking they are just as different on the inside as they are on the outside. And in so many ways, and this, this was the first time I really understood this because it, it's not just a question of tight. It's not a question of tight and loose. Like there are very, very fundamental, um, texture, softness, feeling, dryness, wetness. Um, like there's, there's so many of these skin qualities that exist on the inside. And when you have the correct type for you, and this is what I always talk about because, you know, when I, when I eventually, this was probably a decade or so later that I actually figured out what I was feeling because the whole time I'm like, okay, like these are different, but why? Right. You know, it's like, and, and as I would work with different girls, of course, I would come across a specific type that just, for me, was very difficult for me to wrangle my penis, right? But it's like I could work with another girl and it's like, yeah, we could have sex for hours. And I'm like, why? What is going on? Because it wasn't, it wasn't so black and white as, oh, this one is tighter than this one. That's not the case, right? Like it's so much deeper than that. So, so that's where I, I started to notice that, that there was this thing that I termed um, sexual alignment. And that's where I came up with the, the, the concept of the lock and key because, you know, you, there will be a type, there will be a type of vagina that just fits your dick just from that perspective. And from the women's perspective, the same, I've had some talks with some women where I discuss this, you know, cause I break down all the different types of penises. Right. And I'm like, think back to a time, the one that felt good. And have you ever come across one that was shaped almost identical? And how did it feel? And they go, Oh yeah. Yeah. That one really like, yeah. It's like, Oh, you know, so to, to tell you a quick story, um, my, my business partner, Mike John, um, I used to work for him all the time. He was one of the most famous directors of the, of the early two thousands. And I get this call from Mike cause he had worked, he had shot this girl and I get this call and he says, Everhard. I just, I just worked with this girl and she has the best pussy of all time. He goes, you have to fuck her. 
Like you have to, you like, it'll change your life. And I'm like, you know, this is coming from a good friend of mine. I said, Oh my God. Like, you know, and, um, it was a funny story that, uh, there was one company that did eventually book me with this girl. So you can imagine me showing up to the set. I was like, I was beyond excited. I said, Oh my God. Like my friend said, this is going to be the greatest sexual experience of my life. I'm like super excited. Right. And, uh, and so it heard me start working together and it was just like, eh, eh, it's okay. Right. Like it was nothing like what I was expecting. And that's when I really realized like, look, these, all these different types, they line up differently for different people. So the same type of, of vagina that might be the lock and key for me is not going to be for you. It's not going to be for the person down the street. Like it's all individual. So you have to, that's why you really start to have to paying attention to what type does sort of feel good for you. And the reason I bring this up is because a lot of times I think when we don't have sexual chemistry with someone, it's actually because we don't have sexual alignment and that's biological. And I, you know, from my own personal experience, I've had it happen twice now where I've been in a relationship with someone where they checked all the boxes except that one. And, and here's the problem. And this is another issue that I have with some people where, you know, the, whenever you're having some sort of um, sexual issues with your significant other, they'll say, well, it's all down to communication. And I agree. Communication is very paramount and you need communication. Communication will not fix biology. Right. right. Like if you're, if you're, if you're five foot six, there's no amount that I'm going to communicate with you. That's going to make you six foot five. It's not going to happen. <laughs> right. Right. But, yeah. but, but, but nobody wants to think about that in terms of sexuality. They'll just say, right. well, magically communication is going to fix everything. Well, not if there's a biological um, issue. Right. And so if, if the way that your dick is shaped does not work for the way that her pussy is shaped and for the type of skin and for the type of wetness and all these things, Right. Like I've I've had sex with girls and it was super painful for me. Well, you're not going to want to do something that's painful, are you? Like here, here, sex is this beautiful act of connection and intimacy and, and, and feeling great. And so imagine like every time you're like, oh, God, do I have to do that again? Because it hurts like a hell. Well, you're probably not going to want to do it. Well, now, how does the rest of your relationship go? Right. And there's no amount of communicating that is going to make it feel better. Not when it's a biological impediment. So you, you then are, you have to realize that then you sometimes need to let relationships go. If you, if, if sex is something that matters to you and it matters in your relationships, if that alignment's not there, you do have to understand it's never going to change. So then you have to make the decision. Do I stay in a relationship that has this uh, sex that is not fulfilling for me? And do I stay in it because of every other option or do I search for hopefully finding someone where I can find that alignment? And it's just, it's just understanding because I think people sometimes get stuck in relationships way too long where they probably should have left earlier simply because there's just, there's no alignment. And if sex matters to them, then they owe it to themselves to be honest with themselves and say, you know, this ain't going to work for me. So it's it's a really interesting concept and it's when it's the first time i've ever heard anyone talk about biology in terms of like a sexual connection um which i found really interesting and i think it probably it i think it's probably should be explored a lot more than it actually is um but yeah no that's a really interesting concept um right so i kind of have some questions about the porn industry that i really want to ask you um, sure. so i kind of want to ask you about fame first um and when you first entered the porn industry did you like the first time there's someone came up to you before and said oh can i take a picture eric and like you know how did that feel in terms of when you first had the film oh man i remember it was so weird the first time it happened uh if i remember correctly it was actually at a concert i was at, i was at a heavy metal concert and there was a guy in, in front of the crowd i think it was like yeah it was I want to say probably 2000 and he was just like oh my god i've seen you right and i was like 
okay right i was i was so young back then um so uh yeah it was it was you know for me it's interesting because i've never been a seeker of fame hmm. it's just not my personality type so for me it was always really easy to navigate because um you know if, if people come up to me i'm 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 easy going i'm friendly i'm talkative I'm just like a regular guy. They're like, wow, you are so normal. I'm like, well, how, how am I supposed to be, right? Like, you know, I mean, yeah, it's like yeah. even, even when, you know, I'm, uh, you, well, you've listened to the book, so you've, you've had a real chance at it. I mean, I wrote the book like I speak. Yeah, you know? that's, so, the, that's the one thing I found. Well, yeah, I, I, oh, I, yeah no, I, I mean, it's my voice, right? So, yeah, yeah. so it's it, because it's like, well, why would I do it any other way? I mean, that's being disingenuous. You know, it's the same thing like, you know, if somebody meets me on the street, like, hey, what you see is what you get, right? Like, this is me. So um, so for me, it, it, it's always, you know, people have always been respectful. I've never had any issues. You know, it's like, I'll take my time, you know, to, to, to talk with them. I mean, you know, I mean, there's always a level. I mean, I did, I did have a, you know, I did have a couple stalkers and that was weird. But um, oh, but yeah. God. Yeah. Um, that's a bit weird that you've a couple of stalkers, but I suppose people like that in this world. I mean, I mean, I've had. I'll tell you a story that that you'll get a laugh out of. Um, <laughs> this was uh, when I was still living in Los Angeles, and uh, I was on a date. Right now, I had, yeah. I had met this I had met this girl um, at a rave like the week before, and uh, so we were going on our first date, <clears throat> and we went to this nightclub in in LA. And, you know, we're having some drinks, we're on the dance floor, we're having a good time. And this group of like seven dudes walks through the dance floor, getting to the other side and they stop and they just go, oh my God, it's Eric Everhart, right? And now, <laughs> you know, full disclosure, I always tell, you know, anybody within usually the first five, 10 minutes that they meet me, like they know who I am, what I do, right? So this girl already knew, like she was on a date with a porn star. But uh, these guys just stop in the middle of the dance floor and they're like, oh my God. And then they, they want to come and they want the the pictures and everything. And I just remember, man, the guy turns to her and it's like, do you know who this is? <laughs> you know, she's just like, like she's in shock, right? He's like, this is motherfucking Eric Everhart. Have you seen his <laughs> dick? His dick is like this fucking big. Have you fucked him? Oh, you got to fuck him, man. <laughs> I was, dude, I was... I was literally like mortified. I was thinking to myself like, oh God, thank God she knows what I do. Cause like if I had said like, oh yeah, I'm a lawyer, I'm an accountant. Like if I'd said anything else and then suddenly a group of guys comes through and say, oh, have you seen his dick? You need to fuck him. Oh God, it would have been horrible. So <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting night to say the least. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, yeah. So you just, uh, what, in terms of relationships within the porn industry, is it hard? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not like relationships within the porn industry, but yeah, relationships within the porn industry, but also relationships with people who are not in the porn industry. You know, is it hard? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not easy. And I have to, I have to preface that by what does that mean? Because, um, you know, we can also look from the perspective of no relationships are easy, right? Like, I think, mm. you know, if you were to look, you know, if I said, hey, you know, how, how tell me about your relationships, you'd probably say, well, you know, these, these ones were hard or this. I mean, in general, when you're talking about relationships between men and women, they're always, you know, they, they have their ups, they have their downs. It's, it's, it's complicated, right? Um, so when you're talking about relationships and you're mixing it with porno, well, then you've got the two sides, right? It's like, well, there's the girls that you date that are within the industry, <clears throat> those are um, easier in some facets and harder in others. And then the same thing goes when you're dating civilians, because that's what we will refer to anybody that's not in porno. We say they're civilians. <laughs> so, um, so if you're dating a civilian, again, there will be other aspects that are much easier to deal with, and there will be other aspects that are harder. So it really depends, you know, from both sides. Neither side is going to be easy, right? You know, on... On one side, if you're dating an actress, then, well, there's a chance they're just as crazy as I am. So that's never a good, you know, if you're going to have crazy people in a relationship, it's usually better if it's just one. Two crazy people is usually too much. <laughs> then you've got the, the aspect that they understand, like, so both sides understand 
what the other person does. So there's not usually a problem there. But then you have the um, the politics and stuff that goes on within the industry. So, you know, it's like, hey, there might, you know, if I'm dating some girl, well, there might be some girl that she hates. So she doesn't care that I'm going to go to work and fuck somebody, but I better not fuck that girl because that's her enemy, right? And then if you do accidentally or you've done something in the past, it's like, well, now it's it's the biggest drama in the world because ah, I hate that person. And I've, I've had the same thing, right? So then it's not, it's not that you have a problem with the person doing the job, but it's very dependent on who they're doing the job with, right? So there becomes a lot of politics with that. Um, but at least they understand the job. Um, you know, you're dating a civilian uh, and sometimes that's a lot easier because, of course, they are totally removed from the job. So there's no, you know, they don't have to hear about you at all from any of their coworkers or friends, right? Because if you're dating someone in the industry, you know, someone might be talking shit about me or about her. Or like it gets very political and it's very childish. So you don't have to deal with that when you're dating a civilian. The problem there is they have no concept of what my job entails. So, you know, whereas if you're in the business, like, you know how professional it is, like you understand how a set works, you understand everything. Um, to somebody that's never been on a set, they have no clue. So I think somehow they get this, um, this view in their head that we are just like, we're going there and we are just doing whatever we want. It's one big orgy and all this crazy stuff's going on. I'm like, no, that's not the case at all. Like, you know, there, there's a, it's it's very scripted um you know we'll be doing lots of positions that are not fun like you know i may have to sit around for five hours and you know i mean there's just so much stuff going on like it's not it's not what you you think it is yeah right? i mean i remember um i got i got stopped by this i was having um lunch in in los angeles and i was i was on this patio and this kid comes by and he he recognizes me and he he starts asking me some questions and then I, I explained to him the, the five things that I think it takes to be a top male porn star in the world, right? And so when I got to the second one, which was, you know, you need to produce a cum shot on command, you know, ideally within about two minutes of being asked. He just looked at me. He's like, what? Like, you don't just come whenever you want? <laughs> like, no. Like, like, he just thinks like, we're just going there fucking like, like, like it's that, like, it's like at home, right? Like, hey man, like, well, I just, feel like coming in two minutes yeah let's uh, two minutes yeah it's like no man like that's not how it works <laughs> they own me like like i, I am yeah. owned you know for hours at a time sometimes right like i'm not allowed to produce a cum shot until told to that's just how it is so that's really interesting um mm. so i want to i want to know is is your cock insured there is no insurance. Oh, I should have an insurance policy, but I don't. I never had one. Would know, be smart to do, though. Yeah, yeah, that would be very smart. I know I've, I've seen some porn stars have the uh, pussies um, insured and the cocks insured. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I wanted to ask Here, it. It's yours. The, 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 the funny thing about that, though, is, is could they actually collect? That would be the interesting one, right? Like, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good PR scam, but uh, can you functionally collect on it? Uh, I don't know. So we'd have to see, right? Hey, it'd be Maybe good to say that. though. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I want to know how the how has the porn industry changed in the last twenty years with like in terms of you know social media, the internet, um, DVD sales, and you know how do you get paid with all this, and how has it affected it? Well, it's drastically changed even just in the time that I've been in. You know, so I th I think it's probably been one of the most changing industries but it really has ramped up i mean but everything has you know if we were to look if we were to look at well you know if it's now 2021 so if we were to look back 20 years ago 2001 right it's like well okay at that period of time like hey i could even travel to the states without a passport prior to 9 11 like i didn't need a passport i just traveled a driver's license you know now you got to take off your shoes you got to i mean like there's all this crazy stuff like just to get onto an airplane right um and now look at you know now covid like you, well, you need this test and this test and but like so i mean if we look at from a technological standpoint the business has changed drastically i mean uh on on 
so many levels. Um, you know, when I started, it was it was VHS sales. Yeah, we sold VHS tapes, and then from there, shortly a couple of years later, then out came DVDs. Then we were doing DVDs for a while. Then you had the internet just starting. So then you had the internet. Then you had um, uh, torrents. You had the torrent sites that came along. But the big killer, the big killer for the business, uh, you know, at large was when the tube sites started. Because that was... YouTube, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When when they came out with the tube, the tube sites. Because the torrents weren't a big problem. Because even me, like, I don't know how to work a torrent. Like, it still takes some skill. But there's no skill required on a tube site. You just click. Click and watch, right? So... And so that drastically changed the landscape of porno. And then, and then porno has changed again. You know, like when I look at the last five years, you have a total changing of what porno has become because, you know, now you've got these girls that are making so much money because of this, you know, only fans and stuff. Right. And, and that really, at the end of the day, I mean, at the end of the day, money and porno is just all about controlling traffic. Right, you have to control the traffic that's coming to your to your site, and you know, prior the traffic was controlled by well, first it was controlled by you know these different um, thumbnail gallery posts, right? Like you had back in the day, there was one called the Hun, and the Hun was really big. And but it were, there were all these places where people would post photos, and they were free galleries, but that's where all the traffic went, right? So if you had a website and you wanted to get people to view your stuff, you had to put it up on these big sort of traffic hubs. And then later, of course, the traffic became the tube sites, right? The tube sites where all the traffic is. And so now if you want to get, you know, get your website seen at all, you've got to throw stuff up on these tube sites. But now, now with social media, these girls are like, wait, I have all the traffic in the world, right? You know, and some of these girls, you know, they have you know, a million, two million followers, and now they're just moving those followers to their personal little OnlyFans, and some of them are making just ridiculous amounts of money. So, uh, yeah. so what you know, I, and, and I can't predict where the business will go, but what I'm seeing already is I think, I think more and more you're going to have quote unquote mainstream porno companies die, and I think it's going to be more, more of these decentralized sort of little, you know, girls doing their own thing and. And uh, I think that's where it's, where it's eventually going to go. Um, is that good? Is it bad? I don't know. I mean, also, I think there's, well, I think there's a lot of negativity to that just when you look at it from a societal scale, right? Because it's like, okay, well, you know, if we look at sort of the um, the rise of the, I don't know if it's Gen Z generation or whatever, but, you know, they're just staying at home, playing video games, you know, and now you, you read in some countries, it's like, oh, they, they, it's video games and a sex doll and they're good. It's like, okay, well, so you now you're, you've got the technological abilities, you know, you're just completely stepping away from interacting with real life women, right? So I think, you know, as, as some of the generation gets so immersed in, you know, the porno, the video games, the whatever, you know, this instant gratification culture that they decide that, well, they're just going to check out of actual real relationships. And I don't know if, if, you know, the, the, the easier amount of the porno consumption is going to contribute to that, but I could see it potentially happening. Definitely was a massive industry shake up there. Um, are you a spiritual man? Yeah, definitely. Do you do, do you believe in God? Yep. Quality. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it was, it was in a weird way. I mean, the whole reason I ended up in Czech Republic was a, basically a spiritual journey um, because I actually, uh, have you ever heard of ayahuasca? I have heard of it, yes, but I don't know much about it. Yeah, so I've done seven journeys now. And actually one of my journeys was the reason that I ended up here in, in Eastern Europe. So I had a really intense journey when I was in San Francisco and based on the visions that the, the spirits told me, I, two months later, I sold all my worldly possessions, took my dog, jumped on a plane and I've been here ever since. So that's correct. That's, that's meant. So you literally took the leap. Oh, a hundred percent. And it, it was fascinating. I mean, 
<laughs> it was really interesting because I had a I had a business coach that introduced me to the medicine and and um, I don't think I would have done it if the visions had not been that intense. Now, granted, later they told me, you know, sometimes you got to sit with the with the visions afterwards and not take them like completely at face value, right? Um, but uh, the coach I was working with at the time, he knew I wanted to come over here anyways, so he was like, "Ah, eh, fuck it," you know, like. If that's what you saw, just go do it. So, because I really don't think, and 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 this is this is something you know your audience can really kind of look at, right? Because it, it was a kind of a teaching moment for me. Like we will always talk about something that we want to do, and we've got all the excuses in the world why we won't do it. You know, it could be like, hey, I need to quit this job and go pursue this. And you think, well, yeah, but well, maybe I shouldn't do it, blah, 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 blah. And you just don't. You never pull the trigger, right? You don't pull the trigger for whatever. And um, so sometimes you need you need that kick in the pants that is just so, it's such a hard kick that it puts you into action. And for me, it was it was seeing the visions because I wanted to move forever, but... I mean, that I, I'd wanted to move since 2004. Well, I moved in 2011. That's 11 years. Right? Yeah. It's like, it's like, um, why did it take so long? And then now you did it. Well, you did it like. Oh, yeah. And, and it's not ago. only that I did it. I did it in two months. <sighs> it's not. It, so, 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 you know, that's and that's amazing. what I, I'd like your audience to hear is like, you know, sometimes it's just it's 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 all in your mind the whole i can't do it this that it's the the construct is only in your mind that's preventing you from doing it right so as soon as as soon as your mindset changes it's like oh okay i'll just sell all my shit and get on a plane well that wasn't difficult i mean it really wasn't you know <laughs> i mean i did it and, and and i've been here ever since it's something that i've, I've talked about on this podcast before of like um you know trying new things and taking that leap and to hear that you've done that is, it's quite inspirational. Um, the fact that, you know, it said two months there, two months is not a long period of time to reorganize mm -hmm. your life and move to a different country. So the fact that you've done it and you've, you're so happy in the place that you are now, it's, it's really, it's amazing. And uh, I think a lot of the listeners, you know, if they're thinking, no, I don't really want to take this job or I don't, maybe I should move to this country, then this is the inspiration you need right here. Um, well, yeah. and, there's, and there's really something else that I've started leaning into a lot more. Um, and, you know, so we can say God, we can say the universe, however you want to term it, because everybody has their own kind of version of spirituality differently. But, you know, you got to start paying attention to, in my opinion, the signs that sort of the universe is giving you, because they're always giving you subtle signs, right? It's like things are always showing up for you. And... So there's the signs and then there's also what your heart is telling you. And this is probably the biggest mistake I've done over the years because I'm very intellectual, right? So I like to think about like, you know, like, does this make sense in my brain, right? Mm. And every time that I've really been like, no, no, this is the correct, like, this is the logical best decision. It's totally been wrong. Like, even though on paper, it seemed like, hey, this is the smart play. Like, you know, I should buy this stock or this asset because of these fundamental prices no always lose my ass right so there there really is something weird about going with your gut and what does your heart say that i think i don't know exactly what what all the cues are out there spiritually that you're picking up on when you do that but there is something because there's a reason why your gut says do a and not do b because your head can say, oh, man, B makes so much sense. Like everybody would have told me, man, why? No, you got to stay in L.A. L.A. is where all the money is. That's where this is. That's where like that is the, like the logical place. And I was like. Mm -hmm. Eric? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, my internet just went out a second there. Um, it's quite unrelated, but do you like Jordan Peterson? Yeah, I love Jordan Peterson. Yeah. I think he's amazing. 
He's a very spiritual, spiritual man in terms of, mm-hmm. yeah, it's book 12, Rules of Life. Got it right there. Um, yeah, I quite like Jordan Peterson. I think some of his lectures online are really interesting in terms of his whole view on masculinity. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it's 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 such a it's such an interesting topic because in some ways it's it's such a delicate topic these days. You know, nobody wants to discuss it. And, you know, um, I find often we end up um, we end up so afraid to have real sort of discourse about these things, right? Mm. Um, so I, I, I love listening to what he, what he's got to say. Um, and I'm, I'm just a seeker of all sorts of knowledge. You know, I, I, you, I don't think you can ever say like, well, I know everything, you know, all you can do is know what you know, and, and you know it through the lens of what you've experienced. And then if you experience something else, then sometimes you're like, oh, well, okay, now I've, now I've seen this, you know, um, you know, one, one thing we would always say in, in NLP was, you know, the map is not the territory, right? So, so we don't know necessarily what the territory is, but you have your own map and this is, this is, so it depends. Well, how big is your map, right? If your map is only capable of seeing like this little section, well, that's, that's your whole worldview. And then, you know, maybe someone else gives you another map. You're like, oh wait, there's this other stuff over here. And then, you know, and then you get another map. You're like, oh, but, but look at, there's these mountain ranges now. I mean, you know, it's just, it's endless. Right. So, you know, and so I can even see that through through sexuality, right? Like, I mean, you know, I've I've heard of you know these these people that have these crazy, you know, sort of um, almost let's call them like uh, mystical spiritual experiences, right? Like you have like the 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 Montauk Chias of the world where it's like multi orgasmic, like basically, you know, I don't know, like think and you're gonna have an orgasm, like, and it's very possible, right? Like, I'm not at that spiritual level. What I do. You know, because my lens that I view it through is through this complete physical process. So, so that's what I try and tell guys. I said, well, here's my viewpoint. Here's what I've experienced, you know, on a deep, deep level. And here's what I want to give you because at least I, I feel this is actionable. And it's not to say that I'm going to, you know, I'm, I don't disagree with, with the people that have a, a crazy spiritual level of sexuality because that probably does exist. And I'd like to try and get there, but also I don't know that it's very actionable for guys. You know, it's like, um, y- you know, it, it would be like, you know, if, if you're maybe there's somebody, you know, who's who's homeless. Well, you're not going to sit there and talk politics with them. You, you like you're, you're going to give them a shower and, 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 and give them some food, right? Like you got to meet you got to meet people where they are. Right. So, you know, um, you know, I, I, I said to somebody once, I said, well, you know, we can have this whole Zen-like experience about sexuality. But I said, but if a guy, you know, if, if he can't figure out how not to have, a, you know, how not to come in 30 seconds, no amount of Zen is helping him right now. Like, kumbaya is not going to help. What's going to help is <laughs> him, him understanding, well, how do I fix this problem so that I can have a fulfilling sexual experience with a woman that lasts longer than 30 seconds? You know, and then you know, if he builds that up and now he can last for 30 minutes and he can, you know, understand how to, on a physical level, control himself. Now, maybe we can go to a, a crazy spiritual level, but, you know, you, you could have him stuck in trying all these spiritual things and, and that's not going to help him get past where he's at. Right. So you got to meet the, you got to meet the client where they are. Perfect. Um, so I've got, I've got two questions left here. Um, sure. so what's, the craziest thing you've seen on pawn on a pawn set. If you don't mind me asking. Yeah. Um, well, actually, <laughs> do you really want the craziest one? Um, I, the listeners want it. I want it. I was talking okay. to Miracle last night. Sean wants it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, cause it's not in the book. Um, oh, perfect. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> so the craziest thing I actually ever saw on a porn set, um, Oh God, this is, and this was technically legal in the country. I'm just going to preface that before we go into this. Um, so I was working, this was my second trip that I got taken to in, um, in Budapest. And, uh, we had rented this villa that still exists. The guy still rents out his villa to this day, but the villa's changed a lot. And, uh, and this day, 
uh, I'm with this American production and they've rented the inside of the villa. And we have this absolutely, I mean, model stunning. And she was one of the prettiest Hungarian girls at the time. Right. So I'm just like, oh, my God, like I didn't know girls like this existed. Right. Well, outside it was either because I can't remember it was either German or a Dutch company. But they rented the outside and they were shooting their production, right? So you got two productions going on in this building at the same time. Okay. So, you know, we're sitting around, we're, we're getting ready to start filming soon. And the, the owner of the villa, his name was Victor. And so, uh, you know, I knew that people are shooting outside, but, you know, we're not paying attention to them. We're paying attention to our production. So Victor's like, hey, hey, come, 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 come. You got to see something, right? And, uh, and so we, we peeked the blind down. And I see him like, ah, oh, Victor, because, you know, I guess it's a it's a it's a um, the, it's a gay set they're doing outside. Right. So there's like right. some dude giving a giving another guy a blowjob. I'm like, Victor, ah, uh, he's like, ha ha ha. Right. I'm like, OK, whatever. <laughs> so back to our thing. Right. And, you know, time goes by and and uh, and Victor again, he's like, he's like, come here, come here, come here. I'm like, oh, fuck. Come on, Victor. I don't want to see, you know, nothing. And he's like, no, no, you got to see this. I said, okay, fine. So we peek down the blinds and oh, okay. So now, now things have gotten really strange. Cause you know, it's like, it's like some dudes having sex with another dude. I'm like, okay, whatever. But they're doing it beside this little, like this little pony. I don't know why the ponies there. The pony's like tied up and he's eating his little pile of grass. Right. I'm like, I'm like, okay, whatever, Victor back to the hot girl. Right. So, you know, we're, doing everything with the girl everything's going by and then, you know of course one more time victor's like no 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 come you have to see this time right what victor no 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 seriously go out there they're fucking the shetland pony <sighs> yeah true story true story yeah uh, yeah because yeah. <laughs> that because that's 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 legal you could buy those videos in hungary um at least at that time <gasps> And because uh, that, you know, this pre-EU, like there was no regulations. Yeah. So you, go into the, you could go into any of the video stores and they had bestiality tapes. They sold them everywhere. And uh, and you know what was funnier about it than anything else? Oh. This fucking pony didn't bat an eye. <laughs> <laughs> That's insane. I mean, the, 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 the little horse is just chewing the grass, baby. Just... <laughs> Who, am I getting you know, pounded from the back of you? Poor, poor guy's trying to rail the horse. The horse is just like, yeah, this is nothing, dude. This is nothing. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was, that was, I mean, to see something, that was the craziest thing I ever saw. Wish I could Perfect. get it out of my mind, but can't. It's... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I need to take a moment now. Uh, <laughs> right, so my final question for you is, sure. I-, I want uh, three things that you wish in you when you were 21. Oh... Three things that I, I wish I knew when I was 21. Um, I would say the first one is that I can do anything that I put my mind to. That would be number one. Mm. Uh, number two, do not be so trusting of people when it comes to business. And, uh, and number three, love women for who they are, not for who they aren't. And understand that the way Disney and movies portray women is not not how they actually are. And that you need to show up a certain way to be attractive to them. Those that would be is my three brilliant things. advice. Brilliant yeah. advice. That's perfect. So, Mitch, uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I've enjoyed You're every welcome. single minute of this podcast. And I hope the listeners have enjoyed and taken something away from this podcast. But anyways, this is episode 16 with Eric Everhard. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'll see you out for the next one. <laughs>